Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CircuitPython weekly meeting for today, October 31st, 2022. Uh, we've got a special Halloween edition, a spooky meeting going on today. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, if you, uh, the CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware uh, from them at adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, this meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, which is about what time it is right now, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, but if that coincides with a U.S. holiday, um, a U.S. holiday where, where businesses are closed, I should say, since today is Halloween, uh, which is sort of holiday-ish, um, but not necessarily a day where lots of things are closed. So we're at normal time today, but um, for kind of calendar holidays, um, so to speak, that are officially recognized, the meeting... Uh, sometimes we'll get moved, and then it will occur on Tuesday instead of Monday in those instances. Uh, keep an eye on the Discord room, uh, as well as the calendar link, which is in the notes, if you want to get updates uh, about those upcoming meetings, if they should need to move. Uh, we'll also ping the CircuitPythonistas role over in Discord uh, in the event that the meeting moves as well. So um, if you get that role, uh, that's the same role you need in order to speak in this meeting, so it's good for you to have that if you like to participate. Uh, you'll also get notices about any changes to the meeting. Um, like I mentioned before, there is a notes doc that accompanies the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, uh, so you can use the docs to view only the parts that interest you most. The meeting tends to run about 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how many people we have. Um, so you can use the notes doc, uh, as well as the timestamps in it, to skip around if you like. Uh, after each meeting, we'll post a link to the next meeting's notes doc in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. You can always check the pinned message uh, in the CircuitPython dev channel in order to get the link to the latest uh, notes doc. And those uh, links uh, tend to go up within a day or so after the previous meeting, so you can also put your notes in ahead of time. You don't have to wait until Monday morning if you don't want. If you think of a hug report or a status update throughout the week, um, you can hit that pinned link and put those in ahead of time. Uh, the meeting will be held in five parts. The first part is going to be community news. This is a look at the CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. Uh, it's a preview of the Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The next part will be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is going to be a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance uh, for us to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all working on. Uh, the third uh, section of the meeting will be the Hug Reports section. This is the first of uh, two round robin sections. This is an opportunity to highlight the good things that folks in our community and beyond are doing. Uh, take a moment to recognize awesome folks in our community. Uh, the next and uh, fourth section is status updates. Uh, this is the second one of our two round robin sections. Uh, status, upsta status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what you've been up to. Take a couple of minutes to talk about what you have been doing since the last week and uh, tell us what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth and final part of the meeting uh, is the In the Weeds section. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or they can be identified ahead of time as uh, too long for status updates. Um, if you do have in the weeds topics, I know there are a couple down there towards the bottom of the notes doc. Go ahead and scroll your way down there and enter any ideas that you do want to discuss uh, for the in the weeds section. So that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, and so next up, we will get into community news. Scroll up a bit here. This week in community news, uh, get timestamp for this one. The first item is the Halloween Roundup. Uh, this Halloween, which is today, of course, October 31st. Uh, happy Halloween to everyone. Um, there has been a bonanza of maker projects uploaded online that use Python, uh, MicroPython, and CircuitPython. Um, so check out the newsletter this week. There are many, many uh, GIFs and videos and links to Halloween-themed projects, so check those out 
uh, in the newsletter. Uh, you can see that ahead of time now as a draft on GitHub. Uh, and then of course, if you are subscribed, then you'll receive that um, letter in the mail tomorrow. Uh, next up in community news is CircuitPython uh, 8.8, uh, excuse me, 8.00 beta 4 has been released. Um, there is a link here to the Adafruit blog with the release notes. Um, the notable changes since beta 3 are the uh, ESP32 C3 builds are now working again, and the Raspberry Pi Pico can act as a server, uh, as well as allows the use of a static IP address on that device. Um, a uh, quick warning uh, for anybody though, if you are gonna be updating to uh, beta four, the flash partitioning uh, has changed between beta, uh, let's see, I believe it was between betas two and three, and then uh, also between betas one and two. So we are uh, on four uh, is the new one that's coming out. If you're already on three, um, then I believe you have nothing to worry about, but if you are on a version older than three at this point, uh, when you flash the new beta, um, it will, wipe your CircuitPy drive, so make sure you back it up before you do that. Uh, keep a copy of anything important on there on your PC before you make that update. Uh, next up in community news this week is a uh, um, little bug, uh, I guess, has come up on macOS Ventura. Um, so macOS Ventura, that's the a newer version of macOS. I'm not exactly sure when that released, uh, but it turns out there was a, a problem inside of that version that has uh, caused an issue with copying UF2 files to microcontroller boards, which of course uh, is how we typically load CircuitPython devices. Um, so this is quite, a, quite an issue for us. Um, at present time, uh, if you copy with uh, the Finder, uh, copying with Finder, uh, which is the File Explorer application, I believe, if you copy it with Finder, uh, then it results in a cryptic error, uh, unfortunately, instead of copying successfully. Uh, if you are comfortable with the terminal, you can use cp-x command uh, in order to copy the UF2 file, and that is working. Uh, a number of maker companies are jointly reaching out to Apple to seek a fix. Raspberry Pi has stated they'll make a blog post about the issue and its current status on November 1st. So we have that to look forward to uh, an update from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Sounds like tomorrow. Uh, but otherwise, if you use a Mac, uh, just be on the lookout for that. If your uh, OS has updated to Ventura, uh, then for the time being, you'll need to use Terminal or some other program to copy your UF2 files. Uh, next up is the Oshawa uh, has announced new board members. Uh, the Open Source Hardware Alliance, or Oshawa, has announced their 2022 to 2024 board members. Uh, congratulations to Thea Flowers, David Silk, uh, Ginger Zing, uh, let's see, Alu Watabi, uh, Kianola, and Michael Weinberg. Um, so congratulations to those folks, and head over to the link on the Oshawa page if you'd like to learn more about that organization or its new board members. Uh, a few more here. Next one is uh, from the Raspberry Pi Foundation again. Uh, this is a uh, page that contains some tutorials essentially for learning um, how to program uh, with Python. Uh, but also specifically how to teach others to program with Python. So if you're new to teaching programming or you're looking to build or refresh your programming knowledge, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has a free resource called Learn to Program in Python, which is an online course pathway. Uh, it's for educators who want to develop their understanding of the text-based language Python. Each course is packed with information and activities to help you apply what you learn in your classroom teaching. And there is a link there, uh, again, over to the Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, webpage. Uh, and then um, in projects this week, there were lots and lots and lots of great projects uh, in the newsletter, uh, both Halloween and otherwise. Uh, but one of the ones that really caught my eye was uh, this barcodes in Python and CircuitPython projects. So this was published recently on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, this user created a library that um, makes uh, code 128, which is a uh, specific barcode format, a specific style of barcodes. This library makes those barcodes for you, um, and there are actually two different variations of it. One of them runs on CPython and uses uh, PIL, and then one of them runs on CircuitPython and uses Display.io uh, to draw those barcodes. So I am uh, always a sucker for Display.io stuff, and uh, barcodes are actually something that I got super duper interested in at one point as well. So this is about the perfect uh, intersection of those two interests of mine, so I couldn't resist um, 
showing this one. And that is it for our preview items uh, from the weekly newsletter. Uh, just a reminder, the CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter, which is emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com. Uh, this newsletter highlights the latest in Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. If you'd like to contribute your own news or projects, you can edit this week's uh, draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with your changes. Um, you can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email to cpnews at adafruit.com to submit those uh, projects and newsletter ideas. All right. So that will bring us to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. And so uh, overall stats this week, uh, let's get a timestamp in there. Overall this week, we had 36 pull requests merged. Uh, those were by 24 authors, which is great to see. A couple of names of folks that um, are perhaps newer or less frequent contributors or just folks that maybe I didn't recognize uh, who may be new. Um, but maybe just have escaped, um, you know, recognition from me before. And if so, I apologize for that. But the, a couple of those names are uh, RTW uh, Fruity, uh, P, let's see, PIIT79, uh, George Bow, uh, let's see, uh, Sinuros, uh, CS10 Camp, uh, and then uh, the last one I had highlighted there was Gustavo MFB. Uh, so again, thank you to uh, those folks for contributing, uh, you know, potentially for the first time or the first time in a while over on GitHub. Thank you, of course, to everybody else who contributed as well, uh, all of our normal contributors um, and anybody who I may have missed. We definitely appreciate contributions from everyone. So thanks uh, loads to anyone who submitted uh, anything across the libraries or the repos this week. Um, for those uh, 36 uh, pull requests, we had eight reviewers. Um, so thank you to our reviewers. Looks like the usual list of folks there. So thank you, of course, for continuing uh, to review so that we can get new code into the libraries and projects. Um, uh, we had 31 closed issues by 11 people and 19 opened by 12 people. So we are uh, net down by about 10 issues uh, overall, which is nice to see. Uh, and that is it for the overall stats. So uh, to talk about the core, I will turn it over to Dan, if you are available to tell us about that. Sure, thank you. Um, so in the last week, we've had 23 pull requests merged by 13 authors. Uh, Chuck Wan is a new um, contributor. Thank you very much. Uh, there were four reviewers of those pull requests. We now have 22 open pull requests. This number goes up and down a lot every day. Um, there are some really old ones there that are awaiting, mostly awaiting third-party things. Um, there were 16 issues closed by six people and six opened by six people. There are now 562 open issues on the CircuitPython core. Um, they're categorized in various ways. There are 28 open issues, uh, which we'd like to fix or will triage for the 800 release. There are 13 open issues that we'd like to fix sometime in the 8xx release cycle. There are 20 open issues that have to do with libraries. There are 498 issues that are long-term, which are enhancements or uh, minor bugs. And there are, there are two issues that are labeled support. Um, those usually are eventually passed off to Discord or the forums. And one issue uh, we need to triage still. So uh, that's what we've got for the core. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Katni to tell us about the libraries. Thanks, Tim. This section applies to all of the Adafruit Circuit Python libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore Circuit Python underscore, as well as a few extras such as our cookie cutter and our community bundle. Uh, across all of those repos, we had 11 pull requests merged uh, by 10 authors and six reviewers. Um, Anecdata is not often in our uh, reviewer list for the libraries, uh, more often on the core, so that's good to see. And uh, a number of the new names that Tim listed off earlier are also in this list. So I'm really glad uh, to see those too. Um, and our oldest pull request merged was 63 days, so that's really great to see we're still trying to get through older PRs and uh, leaves us with 38 open pull requests. 
We had 13 issues closed by seven people and 12 opened by six people, leaving us with 576 open issues. 103 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, uh, take a look at circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, uh, including the list of open pull requests and all of the open issues. If you're looking to get into reviewing, check out the open pull requests. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, take a look at the code and leave a comment uh, to let us know that you did, if it looks good to you or if you find an issue. Uh, once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. If you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. Um, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're also always available on Discord to help out. We want you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had one new library, Adafruit CircuitPython Pastebin, and a number of updated libraries that I will not read off. And that's what we've got. Excellent. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, we will hear from maker Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello. So Blinka is our uh, CircuitPython compatibility layer that runs on MicroPython and single board computers such as the Raspberry Pi. And uh, this week we had two pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. Uh, leaving a net of seven open pull requests. There are were two closed issues by one person and one open by one person, leaving, and there are now 83 open issues amongst all the repositories. There were 11,337 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and there were 31,466 PyPI downloads in the last week, which is actually a lot more than I'm used to seeing. And uh, there are currently 98 boards supported. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, and that rounds out um, our uh, overview of the status of the libraries and core, as well as Blinka. So next up, we'll move on to the first of our two round robin sections, the hug report section. Uh, as a reminder, Hug Reports has a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython and community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list uh, as they appear in the notes document um, to give everyone a chance to participate. Um, if you're text only or missing the meeting, but you put your Hug Reports in the notes document, then I'll read them off for you once we get to your turn. Uh, otherwise, if you are here um, and speaking, then I'll call on you and you have a few minutes to tell us about your Hug Reports for the week. So I will... Uh, get us started here. I'll take the timestamp. And so my hug reports this week, uh, thank you to uh, DJ Devin, who submitted some new examples to the request library that show how to make authenticated API requests to various uh, services. I think that's a great addition to um, the examples in that repo to show folks how they can interact with real world uh, services that they're interested in. Um, thank you to C. Grover, uh, who has uh, recently submitted lots and lots of helpful utilities to the community bundle. Um, a, a number of those are uh, stuff that I find interesting in the display I.O. world, but a number of them are also uh, other stuff that I have not found personally a use for, but do look uh, quite handy. So thank you, C. Grover, for making all of that stuff and getting it all published. Um, and then thank you to uh, Tectric. Uh, who will be streaming later on tonight, a special spooktacular Halloween edition of the Community Help Desk. Um, so if folks are interested in getting involved with contribution, uh, but need help or need someone to look over something or show you the ropes on how to use Git or anything like that, uh, if you just have questions, um, head over this evening to that stream, the Help Desk stream, and uh, Tectric will be around, um, I'm sure, with some candy. Uh, unfortunately, we can't pass it out over the stream, but um, you, know, you can enjoy candy yourself, and Tectric will be working on some CircuitPython uh, libraries and things this evening. So check that out. And thank you again to Tectric for doing that. Uh, next up, uh, we will hear from Dan. Okie doke, thanks. Um, thanks to Paul SKPT for uh, testing and documentation of various issues. A um, lot of a lot of like background on things that was helpful for to get to figure out what was going on. Uh, thanks to Johnny Bergdahl for pointing out a 
an issue, a translation issue where we we made it difficult to translate something because it was a sentence fragment and it doesn't always work in a different language. And Naradoc fixed that. Uh, that's great. Turned it into a complete sentence. And thanks to Jeff for continuing continuing to add things to the PyPicoW network support. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, we will hear from DJ Devin 3. Thank you. I have a lot. I've been busy this week, so I've and I've gotten a lot of help from other people this week, so I have a list. Uh, thank you, uh, Hug Report, to Toddbot for setting up his personal repo for Hacktoberfest so my Gatorized PR could be counted for the Hacktoberfest. Uh, hug, big hug to Foamy Guy for taking on the review of my social media API PRs. Uh, that's going to be kind of involved. It's not difficult, but it's involved because you have to register for each a developer account for each service, which is a little tedious, but uh, if Foamy guys taking it on, I know he'll get it done. Um, a hug report to Melissa for reviewing and approving a PR for the seven segment display library. Uh, to DigiKey's Kevin Walseth, Ali Weber, and AJ for their positive reactions to my Hack a Pumpkin 2022 entry. Even though they incorrectly identified Adafruit nudes as Yale Wire, it was still very worth the effort. Uh, and those two are easily confused, so no big deal. Uh, to Gambler for his 3D pumpkin printing bonanza for Halloween. Brilliant display and some new code for eye displays for the RP2040. Uh, to Amberella for the amazing blog posts and social media every single day. Their constant source of inspiration and wonder. To Tectric for finding a potential new bug in the QDPI S2 Wi-Fi scanning and Anic data for helping us um, with bisecting beta tests for that. Uh, we're still not quite done with that, um, so Jerry's still out on that one. Um, to Dan H. and Jepler for the amazing core developments and bug fixing happening every day, and congratulations for the, the beta 4 release. I still haven't installed it, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, to Katney for being the documentation learn guide and GitHub captain of the ship. Your direction is always on point and always appreciated. To Paul Cutler for showing me how magical repositories actually work. And that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, DJ Devin. Uh, next up is Jason P., who is missing the meeting, so I will read theirs. Uh, they have a hug report to Paul Cutler for bringing the CircuitPython Show podcast to town last month and featuring the River Prairie Trolls in this week's episode. Uh, it was great meeting you in person, uh, talking CircuitPython, and enjoying some beautiful fall weather for a couple of hours. Uh, and then next up is Jeff. Hello, I've got a couple of hug reports. Uh, congratulations on hug report to our very own Stargirl for election to the Oshawa board. Uh, to Katni, thank you for reminding me to fill out my hug reports and also for sharing a few photos this weekend. Dan, thank you for the latest beta, so hug report to you. Uh, hug report to George Bow for fixing the same Wi-Fi bug a second time. There was a problem in the core that made MQTT work unreliably. This uh, GitHub user fixed it first for the Pico W and now for the Espressive boards. And that second fix is in the latest beta. Um, last up, we're at the end of the month. So a big hug to all the Hacktoberfest participants, including new and occasional contributors. I hope you met your goals. And finally, a hug for Liz for undertaking another Pico W guide to be published when it's ready. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is Katni. Hello. Um, so thanks to Liz for helping create a fritzing object that I absolutely couldn't get to work properly, even when I tried to do exactly what she did. Um, that was pretty rough and I would probably not have ever sorted it out if Liz hadn't uh, stepped up and been amazing. Um, to Keith the EE for helping me figure out what turned out to be a completely obvious thing if I had read it properly in the first place, but I didn't. Uh, this was unbelievably helpful. It was, um information I needed to be able to do something for a guide and had initially um, pinged a little more about it, but the question I would have asked would have been incredibly dumb. Um, so I was very grateful that I was able to take a um, better question to Lamore instead of uh, the very, very wrong one. Um, to Carter for bumping an Arduino library for me after I added new examples. To Lemon from the Python Discord for explaining one of their features to me. To Tectric for prototyping what we need to do to get PyPI download stats on the libraries and get doing it quickly so we can hopefully present it sooner rather than later. 
to all the folks in the live broadcast chat during Tim's most recent deep dive for trying to help me figure out if there's a good mnemonic for remembering cathode versus anode on an LED. Spoiler, I still don't have one and we'll be continuing to Google it every time. Um, another hug to Tectric for always being up for picking up new things and a group hug for all. Excellent. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, we will hear from maker Melissa. Hello. Um, I want to give a hug to Lamore PT for being supportive while I was out sick. A uh, hug to DJ Devon3 for adding more characters to the seven segment by four um, circle Python driver in a group hug to everyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Next up is Paul Cutler. I've got a hug for C. Grover for helping fix the audio in today's podcast episode. I wasn't really prepared to go outside and he saved the episode. And then Jason Pecor, who mentioned we who mentioned me earlier for reaching out about the River Prairie Trolls. I don't know if I would have ever heard about that project if he hadn't contacted me about being on the show, which was kind of cool. And I'll talk about that in my status update. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Uh, next up in rounding out the hug reports is Tectric, who is not uh, present, so I will read. Uh, Tectric has a hug for DJ Devon3 and Anic Data for helping confirm and test a bug on the Cutie Pie S2. Uh, hug report for Katni for helping me get set up to work on a bunch of new things uh, and helping to unblock anything in the way. Uh, another hug report for Katni and Jeff uh, for the interest and help in vetting new library CI compose, uh, composite actions. Uh, and then a group hug for everybody from Tectric. All right, so that is all of our hug reports for this week. Next up will be the status updates section. Status updates is our time to sync up on what we're doing. I'll start and then we'll go through the list as they appear in the notes doc to give everyone a chance to participate. Uh, when I call on you, take a couple of minutes, talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you will be doing until the next meeting. Uh, this is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too much for status updates, then we can move it down to the in the weeds section that follows. So I'll kick us off uh, with status updates uh, this week. Uh, I have been doing uh, PR reviews and testing, as well as I made a sweep through all of the uh, PRs that were opened at any point this month and added the Hacktoberfest accepted label to them, which I, if I understand right is uh, one of the things that can be done to make them officially count for that. Um, so if you are a person who is working on uh, issues or PRs related to Hacktoberfest uh, and you have a PR open and it does not already have that and you think it should, uh, please ping me on the Discord or GitHub. Um, and I will get that in for you, but I believe we are all caught up there, at least on the library side of things is where uh, I went through mostly. Um, some other stuff that I worked on this past week, I added some uh, kind of finishing touches to the trivia game UI, uh, cleaned up a couple of things, added some uh, visual elements that make it easier to know which buttons go with which answers and things like that. Um, uh, on that same project for this uh, Pico W trivia game, I also, uh, got a cowbell uh, prototype board and uh, soldered some headers onto that and kind of cleaned up my whole circuit by moving it off of a, uh, a breadboard with a bunch of gnarly wires everywhere uh, over to using the proto board and some nice um, evenly sized jumper headers that just run in one big kind of bundle. And so that's uh, been nice to get that a little bit more manageable. Uh, but still also be non-permanent. Uh, I'm not necessarily committed to the exact way that it's wired just yet. I want to still be able to swap it around uh, if a need arises. So this uh, turned out to be a nice in-between step with this cowbell proto board. Um, I also modeled a, a case for that um, trivia device, which was adapted from the uh, an old Etch-a-Sketch project that had a Pi portal inside of it. Uh, the TFT that I'm using is not quite the exact same size and shape as the Pi Portal, but it's pretty close, so that served as a good starting point uh, for this trivia one. And then uh, the other thing I did was, uh, in the core, track down a few uh, more info or uh, help tutorial type links for some of the built-in modules. There's a issue open on the core uh, where we are slowly amassing kind of the best uh, reference links for each built-in uh, module and getting those put in. Uh, so that they'll show up on the actual docs pages. I uh, hunted down a few more of those on Friday's deep dive. Um, and that is it for me. So next up, we will hear from Dan. 
All right, thank you. Okay, so as mentioned, um, I released uh, CircuitPython 800 Beta 4 on um, Sunday, and uh, if you've been trying to use it with ESP32 C3 builds, those are fixed, and there are a bunch of additions and fixes. There's still a lot more to do, but uh, it's better to uh, keep up. This was only a week, and I think there were something like 37 pull requests to report on in the release notes. So if I get behind, the release notes become very voluminous. And thanks to Jeff, I forgot to say in the hug reports, thanks to Jeff, who did a quick review on Sunday so that I could finish the release off. Uh, the thing that I fixed was um, retrieving the sleep alarm after deep sleep. That seems to work uh, better now. There, there are still other uh, alarm problems, but I'll be working on them. I fixed the build for the ESP32 S3 box, which is an expressive um, kind of like thing development module. It's a, it's a board with a, a touch screen and a plastic case, and it was an SPRAM problem. Uh, it kind of has a kind of unusual internal hardware configuration. Um, I'm working on the LC799203 F issue on the ESP32 S3. That's the onboard chip that measures the battery level on various feather boards, and it doesn't work well on the S3. But some users seem to have uh, workarounds that maybe we can add to the library for that. That would be great. And I will continue working on bugs. There are various expressive network problems. Um, that need tracking down, and there are other sleep issues unrelated to the alarm retrieval that also need tracking down, plus plenty of other things. But those are kind of the categories of things that I'd like to work on in the next few days. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Stan. Uh, next up, I will send it over to DJ Devin3. Thank you. I've got quite a lot. I've been busy again. Uh, I've now started using GitHub Desktop more often instead of using the web uploads for even for my own repos. And my understanding of GitHub was way off. And Paul showed me the difference between working directories and how efficient GitHub is versus using web uploads. So I'm transitioning off of web uploads. Like get, using GitHub the way it's meant to be used is way better. Uh, Pre-commit and black are still a constant struggle. And I'm thinking about writing a small script or, or right click uh, context menu helper to automate that because GitHub de Desktop does not have like plugins for black or, or pre-commit. Uh, even though I think when I initially installed it, it should. Um, but yeah, they don't they don't work. So I still have to do that um, verse, um, in CLI. Uh, I showed off my Guy Fox Stitch Pirate Pumpkin on both Show and Tell and DigiKey's Hack a Pumpkin 2022 challenge. And I made the pumpkin for the the uh, the DigiKey challenge. Um, and by far, it was the best pumpkin I've ever done, and all the compliments were truly appreciated. I finished the seven segment social media tracker project, and Tim said he'll be reviewing the PRs for those. Uh, having examples for the social media APIs directly from the request examples library will help all Wi Fi, anyone doing any kind of Wi Fi project with APIs hit the ground running much faster uh, if they. You know, just want like a simple, simple example. Um, I've actually enjoyed working with CircuitPython and APIs, so there will be many more coming in the future. If you have any suggestions for an API you'd like to see, which doesn't require a paid account, feel free to ping me or DM me anytime. Uh, Instagram and Octopart have been requested, so those are next on my list. I got a PR approved for the seven segment display library. Now you can use almost any alphabetical character with the regular clock backpacks except uh, M, W, X, and Z. And it used to be only A through F. So the, all the rest of the alphabet, like you couldn't do. Um, so I put in a PR, fixed that, Melissa approved it, good to go. Uh, and then I submitted a Gatorize demo to Toddbot's display repo, which he graciously gave me the Hacktober best label for and hopefully maybe that will swim up swim upstream into the community bundle as um an eye example and that's all i got this week all right thank you dj devon uh next up is jeff 
Oh, there's that pesky unmute button. So uh, I'm happy to announce that I, by late last week, I was finally feeling over COVID in terms of energy level. And thanks again to all who sent in their well wishes to me. Uh, and I went back and rechecked. Thanks to other bug fixes, the SSL server support for PicoW works now. Uh, the PR is in. I think actually the PR has been merged, but I didn't double check for my notes. Uh, on the weekend, I investigated some micro optimizations to display I.O. There is a draft PR, but it needs more work before it's ready to go in. And uh, you might notice my face looks a little bit different. I changed my Discord avatar for a, to a spooky owl generated by Stable Diffusion. Uh, my branch, the branch that I use is called Invoke AI. And I also created a background slash banner image for my profile the same way. I really can't stop playing with this text to image technology. I think I'll go back to the regular owl next week though. That one was an actual photograph. Anyway, this week, uh, the next keyboard guide for real this time. It's been over a month since the last one. So my goal for the week is to get the guide written for the IBM PC XT to USB HID adapter. Uh, but I will also be doing issues and reviews as needed by Dan. And, you know, as circumstances arise. That's what I got. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is Katni. Hello. So last week, uh, the PCF8575 guide was finished up and put into moderation. That was pretty much it. Um, probably a bunch of MISC, but I don't remember. And I created the PyCalL proto guide, which is up next. So this week, uh, assemble without soldering the PyCalBell proto in the four possible ways and send images to Lamore to verify I understand her intentions properly before I solder them all up because I really don't want to desolder them. Um, once uh, approved, uh, I need to solder up three to four picos. Um, I have one that's already soldered I might just use. And then four pi cowbells. Uh, I need to get four images uh, minimum of each, uh, of soldering each one up to show how to do it. Um, orientation is of huge importance because unlike the Feather or Arduino, both sides of the pico are the same so you can easily add the pi cowbell backwards or upside down. Um, and then I'm going to start putting together the Pi Cowbell Proto Guide. Will likely be mostly assembly photos, but also including I squared C scan code on the P how to use I squared C scan code on the Pico to find whatever stem sensor you plugged into the cowbell for both Arduino and CircuitPython. Um, meeting with Alec this evening to unblock him on the Pi PI stats project. Uh, meeting with Tim this afternoon to walk through setting up uh, RTD and a new library. And then I need to, at some point, do a fritzing object for the QSPY breakout boards that are in the new products list still. Um, only one is needed, only one fritzing object, because they're all the same board with different chips. And this past weekend, lost four hours of my life to a combination of USB being a jerk and Mac OS be being equally jerky. I finally moved my second display from USB-C to my HTMI 4.2 matrix box, or 4x2 matrix box, and added a Thunderbolt 4 hub and everything else about my USB. Am you back? Yes, I am. Sorry, okay. my uh, Discord tab crashed on me there, unfortunately. Um, sorry, I did not. I, you cut off about when you were starting to talk about audio drivers for me. Um, did you finish up with oh. the last of your status reports? And um, either way, do you want to just recap it so it will end up in the recording if nobody's doing it? Yeah, right sure. Um, basically, it took four hours, but I'm using a completely different USB three hub plugged into the Thunderbolt hub via USB-C adapter, because apparently the USB-A side of my brand new Thunderbolt hub refuses to mount drives, including CircuitPy, which isn't an option. Sometimes I hate computers, maybe more than sometimes. That's what I've got. <laughs> Thank you, Katni. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed, I've got a new computer coming, so it'll be exciting to set everything up again, and hopefully we are just not gonna be having any kind of issues anymore with Discord. Um, next up, though, is uh, Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, 
Actually, it's kind of ironic that your computer crashed when she's talking about hitting computers. Um, but for my status update, uh, for the last two weeks, uh, I was out sick due to COVID, and I finished writing up the Clue Robot Guide for my CircuitPython day live stream. Uh, it's in moderation at this point. Uh, I helped to try and troubleshoot a funhouse board for a user. And I worked on updating the Google Assistant Guide and went through and created open issues for the CircuitPython code editor. This week I'm finishing updating the Google Assistant Guide and then I need to update any missing boards from the CircuitPython Beta 4 release. And then uh, probably work on catching up on some GitHub issues. That's where I'm at. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up for status updates is Paul Cutler. I do not hear Paul. I'm, I'm here. Sorry, Tim. You cut out on me. Oh, I got you. Yep. I, hear I you apologize. Now. Yeah, no worries. Um, new episode of the Circuit Python show came out today with Jason Picor and the River Prairie Trolls. Um, there's a park just outside of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and I dropped um, a link to the photo gallery that you should check out because I, I won't do justice explaining them. But there's three trolls in this installation that kids can play with, and they light up and make sounds. And I talked to Jason about how it came to be and how he used Circuit Python to build them and the proof of concept and how they survived the weather. So really neat, interesting episode that's kind of different. Um, and I really like the fact that he reached out to me because I probably would have never heard of that installation. So that's what I got. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds super cool. I'm interested to, uh, to learn more about those. Thanks, Paul. Um, and I did get a note. I was cutting in and out a bit just to uh, make sure before I read the next one, am I uh, here and... and audible and such sounds good now okay thank you appreciate the heads up uh so then uh next up for status updates is tectric who is not present uh so let's see tectric status updates last week uh submitted a new library to the bundle called adafruit paste bin uh, this is a library for using paste bin services like pastebin.com uh, github gist and even adafruit io um, I had no idea Adafruit.io had a tech storage thing that's pretty cool thanks for the tip tectric uh, my goal was to oh I disappeared again and then back again. Yeah, I apologize, folks. I don't know. Uh, I'm afraid to touch anything too much. Um, stop at the top of Tectric. You can hear me now, though. Should I keep going or? Yes. OK. Um, let's see, where was I? OK, so Pastebin library, new library from uh, Tectric for Pastebin and similar services. Uh, my goal was to have a library that would help transmit potentially large amounts of information uh, or saving exception tracebacks when a device isn't hooked up to a screen or via serial uh, in order to print it out. Um, got started on reintroducing Blinka and library PyPy download stats to Adabot and the weekly report using Google's BigQuery. Uh, and then rolled out a new, uh, rolled out the new composite actions to one of the libraries with no issues. Uh, for this week, uh, under Tectric's status updates, streaming a very scary community help desk uh, this evening from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, where I'll help anyone uh, with anything they have uh, or take a look at reviewing PRs or otherwise uh, anything that's a part of Hacktoberfest. So folks, be sure to tune in uh, tonight for that at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, next up is uh, Tectrix looking looking to have a prototype for the PyPy download stats done this week. So the report for the next weekly meeting will have it generated automatically. Uh, it was added manually this week. And then uh, lastly, Tectric mentions hoping to roll out the new composite actions across all the libraries and follow through with any cleanup after the fact. And that gets us to the end of the status updates. So let me take a timestamp for In the Weeds introduction and then scroll just a little bit here and read that portion of it. Uh, so thank you to everyone who participated in our round robin sections, uh, hug reports and status updates uh, to round out the meeting today. Our final section is In the Weeds. This is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These can either have come out of status updates or they can be uh, identified from ahead of time. Um, 
If you have any in the weeds topics, please go ahead and make sure they get added down at the bottom of the note stock. We have a couple in there, so we'll talk about those. Uh, but you want to make sure to get yours in before we catch up because uh, we don't necessarily tend to just wait around for topics to pop up. So get those in early as soon as you think about them. Um, and for the first topic, uh, we have one from DJ Devin 3 So I will pass it over to you if you want to tell us what your uh, idea is about. Uh, thank you. I'd like to code a library specifically for request APIs called API land, but it's above my skill level right now. I'm not good with libraries, uh, functions I can do, but libraries and classes are still kind of out of my realm. Uh, this leaves the door wide open for someone to improve the examples I submitted to be even easier for beginners. And I know that portal base tried to do something like that, but I'm looking for something that's easy for beginners as well as maximizes compatibility across all boards. Um, that, plugs directly into the request API library and just makes things much easier. Um, the API examples that I coded are more of what I expected when I first came into CircuitPython to have available to me, but it just didn't exist. Uh, if anyone wants to take a shot at helping evolve the API examples while maximizing uh, compatibility and keeping it inviting to beginners, it would be greatly appreciated. And so that's, that's my idea. I don't. I don't know if it's a valid idea or if it's something even allowed. Like I, I have no idea. I think I do agree with what Tectric mentioned here. I think this would make uh, pretty good sense in the community bundle or the CircuitPython org bundle if you intend to have other folks um, from the community help out and support it in the uh, in the long term. Um, personally, I would say I think that the examples in the request library honestly are a really good spot for those things. Um, a separate library. Um, I'm not fully opposed to it, but I don't necessarily see the full, I guess, picture because all APIs are different. So any kind of library that interacts with a bunch of different APIs um, is kind of going to be a, almost like a bunch of separate libraries. Um, in my mind, it would almost make sense like if you want a Discord library that does the Discord API, then that's like the Discord library rather than a general API library that does... Um, a handful of different APIs. That's kind of the way that my brain um, breaks it down, at least, is each one because they have different API specs and, like, you know, you have to attach your token in a slightly different way or you have to send it a different type of request or a different JSON body or whatever. Um, because they're all slightly different, I think it kind of makes sense to keep them all separate with the exception being that uh, the intersection is the request library and the examples there, I think, are definitely beneficial to have... Um, that show all of those okay. things. That makes absolute sense. Be yeah, because all of the requests, I, I just don't want to code up, like, start coding a whole bunch of different examples for different APIs and then have a list of, like, 30 API examples with underscore API instead of, like, trying to combine that some you know, more efficiently into, like, a library package that's more trim and neat and tidy like yeah. everybody else is like coding libraries that I can't do kind um, of thing. I mean, I would say, I mean, definitely feel free to to make an attempt uh, at it and, and add it to the community bundle or anything like that. I, again, I'm definitely not opposed to it. I think the, um, the lots of examples, though, I don't look at it as a problem. Um, it can become a problem if they're super disorganized and they uh, are difficult to find what you're looking for. I would say another potential solution to that is add like a um, add a folder potentially inside the examples directory and then put like a, a markdown file as sort of a, uh, a readme for that one section of the repo. And then you could have links um, and you know sentences or whatever that explain what each one of them is. Um, if there is a need for additional organization, that can be done inside the examples um, folder as well, I think. Okay, I'm just starting out. So there's only four right now, but you know, I plan to do a bunch more. Um, so I'll just keep coding API examples. And if someone wants to take that someday and then do something with that, then maybe I'll just do that and just let somebody else do that. And I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for working on all this. And um, yeah, feel free to submit, submit more uh, PRs once you got more of those knocked out. If, if I could just jump in for a second, I want to say, I think something that you were getting at, Tim, but didn't say it explicitly. When we talk about a CircuitPython library, that's something that either all of it or none of it is copied onto your device. 
So it's taking up room on the CircuitPython drive at a minimum. And so if you put 50 different APIs in one library, support for 50 different web APIs in one library, then you've got like 50 files that you copy to CircuitPy. And for your project, maybe you only use two or three of them. And so the right kind of organizational thing to put those in when you're not going to use most of it is not one library. It's some other organizational feature. And I leapt right to what I think you were saying, Tim, which is multiple libraries, one per API, or maybe there's some commonality to pasting libraries like Tectric found. But the default wouldn't be to put every web API in one library because they're just so different and there's potentially so many of them. That makes complete sense. And I would just end up causing the exact issue that I wanted to simplify in the first place. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, DJ Devin as well. Um, next up was one from me. Uh, this was a link. I'll drop the link in the Discord as well to a PR that was opened in the request library. And this is a user who's interested in getting the ball rolling on asynchronous um, support for requests. And so the core of this question boils down to um, if someone is going to work on asynchronous requests, or uh, really at this point someone has started working on it, do we think that we would want that um, asynchronous supporting version, so to speak, uh, inside the same repo, um, and it would get converted to a directory instead of a single file, or would it make more sense if there's like an async requests library that gets created that's its own thing that houses the new version that supports um, async? So I started working on this. Yeah, um, I think this person kind of picked up where you left off. Right, right. And it, it actually, I think what I wrote worked, even though I hadn't tested it, or it almost worked. Uh, the issue, there are a couple issues here. Um, and I had discussed this with Scott and Lamore when I worked on this, which is like months ago now. Um, the way async works, it's really hard to factor out the async parts because anything that is async has to be an async routine. So you end up duplicating a lot of code. And there probably could be some refactoring to share some code, but in many cases, it's not possible. So the problem really is they suggested that I make it a separate library, even though it's mostly sort of copied code with some minor changes. Um, if it was in the same library and it were a separate file, that might be okay. But then the problem is, is that it's this is frozen into a few places like the um, matrix portal, and there isn't enough room to add a whole bunch of more code. Okay. So those are all kind of like only practical considerations, uh, as opposed to. I, logically, I would think it would be in, maybe in the same library if it were very similar. But that's not true of like AIO, HTTP, and some other ones also. But they're not as much like requests as this one might, might be. Gotcha. Okay. So it sounds I like think it does make sense to have a new library, but the maintenance of those two libraries needs to go in lockstep. Yeah, if you of. add an API to one, it should be added to the other. And if you fix a bug in one, it should be fixed in the other. Intrinsically tied together. So maybe yeah. uh, make the new one and then make it real clear in the readme um, somewhere very prominent. Um, maybe even, I don't detect this is maybe something uh, to look into with CI stuff as well. Maybe even we could set it up to where any PR that comes in, it could automatically post back a comment that's like, uh, just FYI, this this library is supposed to stay in sync with this other one, so um, there should probably be a PR over there as well. Yeah, or even just in the source code might be good enough. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Definitely appreciate the, uh, the thoughts and the discussion. I will uh, write a response back on that PR to let them know that it sounds like new library uh, is probably the way to go, and I'll point them in the direction of how they can get set up to do that. Okay. And I think that library should be maintained by us. Okay. Okay. I don't think it should be a community library. Um, in terms <laughs> of uh, naming, if, if anyone has preferences, it's just Adafruit CircuitPython async requests, or do we have something else in mind? 
I don't remember what I called it. I, I actually went through, I thought about that for a while. Okay. And the name I came up in my, I, I'll, I'll post, I'll post a link to my branch for this. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, and then our last in the weeds is from Tectric, uh, maybe text only. Tectric, if you want to give it a try or uh, let me know, um, either way, and I'll, I'll read it text only. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Tectric's uh, in the weeds topic says, there were a few issues like this one submitted recently about tightening up the requirements for some libraries. Uh, and Tectric wanted to ask, uh, what are others' thoughts about these? So this is a link to... Uh, a PR that's in the NeoPixel library. This one is, however, I think it came from a uh, some kind of automated thing. So I think we saw these across a few different libraries potentially. Um, and it's I have not read the whole issue personally or, or PR, but I believe it's something to do with different versions of the requirements, if I understand correctly. Um, Tectric goes on to mention uh, his thoughts are. Uh, that I don't think pinning a maximum revision is beneficial for our use case because it wouldn't matter for microcontrollers if the users are drag and dropping from a downloads bundle folder. Uh, pinning Blinka also means that people won't automatically get updated versions of it anymore uh, if they want to use specific libraries. The risk of interdependent APIs breaking is low. Uh, with the only one that particularly would likely cause issues being Blinka itself. Um, and then this also competes with another set of PRs I'm hoping to look at when Dependabot can understand compatibility syntax, uh, the tilde equal sign, which would better help us manage when to upgrade major revisions. So um, the core of this is about basically pinning the versions. It sounds like today we don't pin the versions in the requirements and then this PR opens it up to say that you should pin the versions in the requirements and so um, we kind of decide do the benefits of pinning um, are, are they enough for us to want to do that or do the benefits that we get by not having it pinned outweigh whatever gain we would get um, and I will say personally I don't I don't necessarily know too much about it however the uh, one that Tectric mentioned, which I it seems at least on the surface to me like I would agree with, is the idea of if we pin it, then we have this thing where either people are steadily using a version that's more and more out of date, or we have to go make a sweep across all the libraries to update um, the version that it's pinned to, which I think we have done stuff like that before, so that's certainly not the end of the world, but if it could be automatic and just on like the newest version or whatever, then um, I think that skirts around that issue and we don't tend to really have API breaking stuff that I know of too much like Tectric mentions as well. So uh, personally, I would kind of lean that way, but I do definitely own up to being uh, not very knowledgeable on the topic. So open to ideas from anybody else. I personally would not rush to implement this person's suggestions. Um... It looks like they have some kind of project, you know, that they're running on on projects to to figure out these things, and they're just filing a bunch of automated PRs. This does not correspond to a real problem that we need to solve for our users. This is somebody who thought it would be fun to open up 150 bug reports, 150 issues across GitHub, and create work for people. And that's a little bit of an uncharitable way to put it, but that's what I'm seeing when I look at the activity of this GitHub account called PyDeps. Um, I, I wouldn't rush to do anything because of this issue. I would probably just close it. Okay. All right. Anybody, uh, anybody else have any thoughts or ideas? Um, I responded on to one on the Blinken one, and it was just like, it's just going to create a lot more maintenance and overhead um, than it and it doesn't actually solve any problem that exists. Okay. So, yeah, I agree that closing it is probably the right move. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, input, folks. Um, I would agree with that. I'm, I'm definitely fingers crossed, hoping that they mean well. But yeah, in this case, it does um, does not necessarily help us out too much. Um, all right. Uh, so we got no other in the weeds topics. So that gets us to the end of the meeting. Let me find the wrap up section. Here we are. Uh, wrap up. I will take the last 
I'm Stamp. Uh, so this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for October the 31st. Excuse me, October the 31st. Uh, happy Halloween to everyone. Thank you everyone who participated. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, the, uh, this meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, uh, which gets mailed out on Tuesdays. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. Uh, the next meeting will be held, I believe, Monday at its usual time at 2 p.m., uh, although I'll admit I did not look at the calendar, so somebody uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, but I believe we're on for Monday normal time next week. Um, It'll be here on uh, Discord, same place as we are now. Uh, you can join any time by going to adafru.it slash Discord. If you'd like to get notified about the meeting and any upcoming changes, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonista's role on Discord. Um, and that's going to do it for today. Thank you for participating, everyone, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.